Hi, I'm Skylar, and today I want to talk about the politics of children's literature, why political organizing is science fiction, and how we might storytell our way toward building a better world for children and adults alike. First of all, you're probably wondering why I'm saying that political organizing is science fiction. That's actually a quote from Walida Imarisha, who is, among other things, a science fiction writer. She says, that science fiction is the only genre that not only allows you to disregard everything that we're taught is realistic and practical, but actually demands that you do. So it allows us to move beyond the bounds of what is realistic and what is real into the realm of the imagination. When organizers imagine a world without poverty, without war, without borders or prisons, that's science fiction. They're moving beyond the boundaries of what is possible or realistic into the realm of what we are told is impossible. Being able to collectively dream these new worlds means that we can begin to create those new worlds here. Imarisha came up with this idea of visionary fiction, which she defines as fantastical literature that helps us to understand existing power dynamics and helps us imagine paths to creating more just world futures. As Adrienne Marie Brown explains, all of our writing is either advancing or regressing justice. We can perpetuate the tropes we are used to. Single white macho man manage, magically saves the planet by having all of the skills and strengths and smarts, while the masses, who are often brown, await salvation. In visionary fiction, we center marginalized peoples, bottom-up collective change, aiming neither for dystopia nor utopia, but that harder, more realistic place in the middle. As somebody who's been passionately interested in both science and science fiction for a long time, one of the reasons I like library science is that to me, library science is the science of stories. Because even when we're talking about information, information by itself doesn't mean anything until you contextualize it within a story. Um, stories that involve people and places and ideas and events and happenings. And so to me, literacy isn't primarily about reading and writing. It's about stories. Diana Masney writes a lot about mul multiple literacy theory, and she talks about the idea of literacies as becoming, as a process of becoming. She says that literacies consist of words, gestures, attitudes, ways of speaking, writing, valuing, ways of becoming with the world. And are, they're about texts that take on multiple meanings. And so, when I talk about literacy as world building, what I mean is that a person constructs their view of the world, their entire view of reality from the stories and the narratives that they internalize as they engage with different kinds of literacies. And so this is literacy as becoming, as world building, as bringing new worlds into existence. Stories are the building blocks of the worlds that people experience and create. And they're not always stories that you can put into words, but they're stories you can feel. They're patterns of events of, in time and space that are contextualized with, within embodied sensory and emo emotional experiences. But see, this is why literature always reflects the cultural values and biases of its writers, because every writer is writing from the perspective of their own story world, from, from the world they have built up out of the narratives they've constructed from their own lived experiences about how reality works. And Levstig writes that it's important when discussing children's literature to think about what worldview a body of literature represents and to put that representation into historical perspective, especially given that children's literature has historically reflected the history, culture, and perspectives of white, Anglo, middle, and upper class males and has tended to stigmatize people who didn't fit that norm. So now I wanna take some time to look at things like who gets to be portrayed as a hero in stories and what kinds of traits are identified as heroic and what kinds of traits are associated with villainy or depravity. Because a lot of this time, a lot of the time, um, the kinds of people who children's literature says are good people versus bad people are linked to colonialist and white supremacist supremacist ideas of civilized people and uncivilized people um, and therefore what kinds of people deserve respect and support 
and protection and what kinds of people must be contained and controlled or in some cases even exterminated. And there are a whole lot of dimensions of racial and cultural oppression that we could analyze through that lens. That could be an entire talk in itself. Um, but right now I want to focus on disability and queerness and gender nonconformity since these are things I can talk about from the perspective of my, my own personal experiences. So, Margolis and Shapiro write that one of the most popular literary devices for conveying evil is the twisted mind and the twisted body, which stigmatizes both physical and mental difference. Um, in Treasure Island, for example, disability is used to represent evil a lot. There's Long John Silver with his one leg, and in the beginning there's Pew who's blind. And, I mean, these are pretty unsavory characters in the story, um, as opposed to the conventional evil abled white male protagonist. Um, and then in Ragged Dick, there was Limpy Jim, who's basically a sidekick of the bully who functions as Dick's main rival. Um, and a lot of villains have traits that are associated with mental illness or neurological difference. They're impulsive, erratic, emotionally reactive, and just generally depicted as crazy. I mean, you have the Joker from Batman who literally lives in an asylum for the criminally insane. And like you have evil mad scientists and all kinds of other ableist tropes. And this is actively harmful because it affects how mentally ill and otherwise neurodivergent people are treated in real life. Um, gender nonconformity is also stigmatized a lot. Uh, there's been discourse about how a lot of villains tend to be queer coded, flamboyant, dramatic, conscious about their physical appearance, etc. And when you have good characters who are gender nonconforming in some way, it's often justified by showing how they're still able to, for the most part, accommodate to their prescribed role in a heteronormative society, or basically how they at least conform to cultural gender, gender values in all the ways that matter. Like in the story of Arabella Harding, um, there was there 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 was that um man who cared for her who was nicknamed betsy because of all his um feminine behaviors and mannerisms um but the text emphasized that betsy still had a man's heart and was like courageous and valiant and all of those things so like it's okay <laughs> we can we can we can look past all that other stuff and then um in The Witch of Blackbird Pond, Kit's independent and free spirit is legitimated by the fact that at the end of the story, she gets a happy ending that involves traditional heterosexual romance and marriage. It's like, see, she's still wife material, so it's okay. Caddy Woodlawn has kind of a similar narrative where her being a rough tomboy type during her childhood is portrayed in a generally positive light. But in the end, she learns to be okay with and even enjoy the sorts of traditionally feminine domestic activities that she'd always rejected, rejected in the past. And to leave the more wild ways of her childhood behind her as a necessary part of growing up. <sighs> Juno Diaz once said in a speech he gave at Rutgers University, if you want to make a human being into a monster, you deny them, at the cultural level, any reflection of themselves. So if you're always seeing people who are not like you portrayed as the heroes of stories and people who are like you being portrayed as, portrayed as the villains, I mean, if society keeps giving you these stories that basically tell you you're a monster, that can often be a self-fulfilling prof prophecy. Like, if all you're ever going to be is a monster, then what motivation do you have for trying to not be a monster? And if the only way for a person to not be a monster is to adopt the sorts of behaviors and cultural narratives and things that totally clash with your natural ways of thinking and communicating and connecting, connecting with other people, that's not sustainable either that basically makes a person perpetually divided against themselves, which hurts their ability to form meaningful and mutually supportive relationships with other people. 
So basically, we need to start telling new stories that help children and adults alike learn to have healthy relationships with other people without dividing human beings into these binary categories of good people versus bad people, of those who are civilized and uncivilized, of proper human beings versus monsters. I mean, we're all monsters in one way or another. I mean, humans are animals and biologically we're predators. And those predatory instincts are in fact a big part of what drives colonialism and other forms of oppress oppression and exploitation and violence. Humans are biologically programmed for predatory behavior. We just need to learn to stop preying on each other. And part of that is telling the kinds of stories that facilitate um, mutual sustain, mutually sustaining and reciprocal relationships instead of reinforcing hierarchies of dominance and exploitation um, of inferior people by superior, superior people. Um, so one narrative that I found really helpful is the idea of functional diversity, which is all about like in inclusivity of different abilities. Basically different people have different abilities and different needs. And all behavior is an attempt to get needs met in some way. So when people are behaving destructively, it's because they don't know how to get their needs met in more constructive ways. I mean, I'm a parent, this is how kids work. <laughs> and it's how adults work too. So basically, I believe that people need to work together in community to figure out how they can all use their different abilities to ensure that everybody's needs get met in ways that are good for everybody. And then another, another narrative is actually something I got from the book, The Little Prince, which we didn't talk about in this class, class but it was written in 1943. Um, but it talks about this concept of taming and because at one point in this book, this prince meets the prince, who's the main character, meets this fox and he asks the fox to play with him. And the fox says, I can't play with you. I'm not tamed. And the prince asks, what does that mean, tame? And the fox says, it means to establish ties. To me, you are still nothing more than a little boy who is just like a hundred thousand other little boys, and I have no need of you. And you, on your part, have no need of me. To you, I am nothing more than a fox like a hundred thousand other foxes. But if you tame me, then we shall need each other. To me, you will be unique in all the world. And to you, I shall be, I shall be unique in all the world. And that got me thinking about the difference between domestication and taming. Like domestication is where you exert power over a person or an animal or nature itself to try to contain and control it and force it to conform to your expectations. And that's the kind of thing that like colonialism tries to do. Whereas taming is more reciprocal. Taming is about building a mutually rewarding connection so that in a way, whatever you tame also tames you as you develop more of a bond with each other. So eventually in this story, in The Little Prince, the fox asks the prince to tame him and the prince says, I want to very much, but I have not much time. I have friends to discover and a great many things to understand. And the fox says, one only understands the things that one tames. Men have no more time to understand anything. They buy things already made at the shops, but there is no shop anywhere where one can buy friendship. And so men have no friends anymore. If you want a friend, tame me. And the prince asks, what must I do to tame you? And the fox says, you must be very patient. He explains how it has to happen very gradually 
saying that the prince must sit a little closer to him every day and that he must say nothing because words are the source of misunderstanding. He also says that one must observe the proper rites, meaning there needs to be some element of ritual about it, some regularity and consistency, because that's important for establishing trust. And one of the last things that the fox says to the prince after they have tamed one another and become friends is that you become responsible forever for what you have tamed. And so I think these are the kinds of stories that we need to start telling in order to reduce violence and oppression and work toward building a more inclusive world. This is the kind of narrative that will help with that. We need to open ourselves up to taming and being tamed by one another, to establishing ties with one another, and in so doing, to become responsible for one another, responsible for supporting and sustaining one another in all our different abilities and different needs and all our different ways of being. This is the kind of narrative we need to normalize where instead of dividing human beings into monsters who need to be domesticated and civilized people whose job it is to do the domesticating, we learn together how to tame the monsters both in ourselves and in other people. These are the kinds of stories that I think will help us build a better world anyway. So what do you think? What kind of world do you want? Until next time.